Great, admit all, so somebody's admitting people, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to Power Skills. You are joining us for our timely tech talk today with our powerhouse panelists. A few housekeeping rules. Um, please make sure to keep your mics and your cameras off um, to preserve bandwidth and to lessen any background noise that we might hear. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat and we will do our best to make sure that your questions are answered. As we wait for people to continue to log in, do you guys want to share where you're tuning in from? Are you in Montreal? Are you in Ontario, New York, uh, international? Uh, feel free to share and let us know where you're calling in from. Ottawa, amazing. Alexi, Montreal, Mexico, welcome. In San Francisco, hi Noel, I saw you at our previous session, welcome. Laval, amazing. St. Jean sur Richelieu, fantastic, it's my hometown. Montreal, yes, that's amazing. We'll give it a few more minutes. St. Hubert, thank you Jessica for sharing. Toronto. So without further ado, um, let's get started. My name is Valerie Ndueni, and I'm joined by my colleague, Nayo Garieppi. Say hi, Nayo. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. <laughs> We're both members of the CATS team, and on behalf of McGill University, McGill School of Continuing Studies, and the CATS team as a whole, thank you for joining us, and welcome to a timely Tech Talk. So to introduce our panelists, I'm gonna start off by introducing Mr. Rod Luisa, Senior Management Professional with over 16 years of IT experience, eight of which which have been focused on IT consulting. He's a chartered manager and forward-thinking strategist with a proven track record of taking a global approach to creating and building innovative solutions for his clients. Rod, welcome. Thank you, Val. Um, can you tell us a bit, of, bit more about the work that you do now? Yes, uh, currently I'm an application performance manager at Bell Canada. So basically I manage a portfolio of eight mobile application. So I help between development team and operation team to set up, uh, you know, monitoring capabilities and also in terms of reporting a lot of KPI for executive to understand the customer experience, the customer behavior in terms of how to use our application and also what is the experiences while using the application? Are they having a good experience or where can we improve that experience? Amazing, thank you, welcome. I think we're gonna have a lot of questions for you a bit later. Um, okay. Next up, Gloria Aravello, welcome. Thank you for joining us today, Gloria. Gloria is a telecommunications professional with a bachelor's degree in electronics and communications engineering and a master's degree in management sciences. She has over 15 years of experience in the implementation of mobile wireless technologies. I think you and Rod should talk. Thank you for joining us today, Gloria. Can you tell us a bit more about the most recent work you've been doing with 5G technology? Of course. Uh, thank you, Valerie, for the introduction and the invitation. And uh, well, the most recent work I did with uh, 5G networks was uh, trials for customers. So basically, the project consisted on uh, testing the 5G radio technology. Uh, depending on the customer, they choose uh, a set of testing, uh, lab laboratory testing, field trials. So uh, this means that uh, they install the equipment on a, on a specific area. And uh, we measure the performance of the equipment. So basically, uh, we organize the testing, we agree uh, which type of test needs to be performed. 
And then uh, the customer comes, uh, makes the testing, and uh, they share the results and uh, any highlights that they need to uh, address with the, with the supplier. Amazing, thank you. Next up, Mr. Saif Malhem is an engineering professional with experience in private and nonprofit, as well as startup environments. He's a graduate of McGill University and currently works at Seed AI, an AI consultancy and services firm based in Montreal. Welcome, Saif. You also currently lead two project hubs. Would you like to expand on what they are and the work that you do there? Sure, uh, with, with pleasure. So you're speaking about the, uh, the Montreal hub of Global Shapers. Uh, a quick synopsis, the Global Shapers is an organization that was started by the World Economic Forum in 2011, and it has around 400 hubs around the world. So we're about 30 Global Shapers based in Montreal, um, and we lead grassroots initiatives and grassroots projects. So I'm leading two projects there. One of them is about AI. So we're, we're measuring the pulse of the city of AI. Uh, you know, there's a lot of investments, uh, and, and there have been for the past two years coming into the city uh, and establishing AI labs. Uh, and, and AI is technology affects us all in many ways, but we wondered, uh, how can we make sure that the voice of the public who are going to be affected by those technologies is represented, uh, is represented especially when it comes to uh, policy making tables. So we were surveying the, uh, uh, the, the public on AI uh, so that we, we give that input to policymakers. The second project is uh, for clean technology. So it's also a technology project. Um, I think it's particularly relevant given the, the current context of uh, the reset that we're going through with COVID um, and the decrease of global house gas emissions that we're increasing, uh, that, that we're experiencing. So the, the goal of that project is to take all the research that has been happening with academics and professors in research labs that's still in the technology transfer offices boundaries and give them that last push with uh, what we call design sprints, which is an innovation exercise to see this research, which ones have sort of hold are good candidates to become solutions that are commercialized in the market, whether as products or as startups. And that way we will sort of flesh that out and help, help them join the ecosystem of, of startups and innovation in, uh, in Montreal and Canada at large. So I, I could spend the whole hour just talking about those two projects, but this is a quick synopsis. Thanks for, for, uh, for raising those questions. No, thank you. You sound like you're a very busy man. That's, that's quite a lot to be, be taking Fun. on at the same time. Last but not least, Ms. Shauna Barnes is the Director of Program Management at AppNovation within the Montreal office. She has achieved both her PMP and Portfolio Management Professional Certification. Shauna has utilized these certifications to help her lead large teams in delivering digital apps, courses, and websites over the last 15 years. Welcome, Shauna. That is quite an impressive list of certifications and qualifications. Are you still adding to them? Actually, I am, yes. And thank you for asking, Valerie. And thank you for inviting me to speak at this conference. So I'm actually still going ahead and pursuing my executive MBA, the Sander Moen School of Business. Uh, so I do that part-time while managing two very young kids, one that's 10 and one that's one. So it's keeping me quite busy. You must be busy. And, and working at AppNovation, would you like to kind of let us know what the company does for those of us who aren't familiar? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're a digital strategy company that's basically out there in order to help our clients deliver on anything related to the digital market. So whether it's the creation of apps, um, creation of websites, um, helping them to formulate how can they go ahead and expand in the digital market, we're the agency to come to, to in order to help with this. Um, I personally manage a team of project managers, programmers, in order to help deliver right now. We're working on an app for a very large Fortune 500 company and as well websites for uh, various Fortune 500 companies. So that is what I'm working on. Amazing, amazing. Thank you all for being here today. So the goal of this panel is to have a very timely talk about tech. There's a lot going on in the tech space, um, even before COVID hit. And now that our worlds have been disrupted, um, it's going to be very interesting to see where the world of tech is going to go, especially with remote work and, and how companies need to start rethinking how they're doing things. 
So thank you all for joining us, for the attendees who are here today. If you have any questions, again, feel free to type them in the chat. If you want to use your own voice, um, just let us know in the chat that you have a question and we'll try to accommodate you to ask that question yourself. Perfect. So to get started, I think, you know, I, I was reading up the other day on there's a lot of conspiracy theory around 5G lately, and um, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about 5G. Governments are excited. Um, companies seem to be buzzing with the talk of 5G and what it can do for them. Gloria, would you like to break it down to us and kind of, in layman's terms, tell us what 5G is and its potential value to the industry? Gloria, I think you're on mute. Yes, I, sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, well, 5G is the next uh, evolution of uh, cellular networks, basically. Uh, we, most of us remember uh, GSM networks a long time ago, uh, beginning of 2000s. It was only voice. Uh, next, we had a 3G. We had voice and we started to have uh, some data in it. We could uh, go to, the, to some websites uh, with some limited uh, data. And uh, beginning of 2010, uh, LTE networks arrived. This is 4G, okay? So this, uh, this enabled the cell phones and other type of services to have a bigger broadband of data. This time we could uh, watch a YouTube video faster and uh, we could have a, a, a broader type of applications in a cell phone. Uh, what's 5G? 5G is the technology after uh, LTE. Basically what it is, it's a technology very similar to LTE, but with enhanced capabilities. If we talk about, uh, trying to simplify a bit, if we talk about a pipe, 4G uh, give, give us a very good bandwidth in terms of uh, capacity and speed, 5G will, will, give us, uh, will give us more capacity, okay? So uh, it's not only uh, the capacity and speed, but also the, the latency. Latency, it's the time that uh, it takes from, for two devices to communicate between each other, okay? LTE, uh, to give a reference, uh, for example, uh, let's say that uh, LTE latency is 30 milliseconds. That's um, like one third of a second. And uh, with 5G, we would get the communication uh, up to one millisecond. So that's how fast it can be. Uh, saying that, what are the benefits that we will have? For us, for users with a cell phone, will be uh, speed. Also, will bring uh, more capacity for uh, having uh, services like, for example, uh, instead of having a cable uh, modem for, for internet in our homes, we might have in the future a 5G modem to, have, to provide internet for home, okay? Some other uh, big application that come, it's uh, IoT. IoT, the Internet of Things, it's a communication between machines, basically. Uh, we already have this kind of services, and uh, I can think that the most common that we know maybe right now is our Alexa. Our Alexa, where we can manage our devices. We, we uh, interconnect uh, similar devices, uh, for example, our Alexa with, uh, with our thermostat. Now it's possible, right? We can say, Alexa, uh, bring down the temperature, or Alexa, uh, uh, please uh, turn on and on, on off the thermostat. So uh, these kind of applications are Internet of Things. With 5G, uh, what we get is uh, a broader uh, field of applications. For example, not only will be our Alexa, it will be uh, bring, uh, it will be brought to our healthcare. We will be brought to uh, having a a more interactive communication with our physician. Maybe uh, we have a wearable that uh, detects our uh, heartbeat rate, mm -hmm. and that will be sent to a computer in the hospital or to our doctor's office Ooh. that will be monitored. Okay. So uh, that's one of our benefits. Uh, another one will be, uh, for example, uh, smart cities, where traffic will be detected, and perhaps uh, during the rush hour, the time between red lights and uh, will be different. Uh, there's a lot of applications that can come. Uh, another one is uh, virtual reality. 
uh, augmented reality where, uh, where perhaps uh, we can see now holograms in a very fast uh, reaction time. So there's a lot of things that 5G is coming. Uh, I, I read uh, months ago an article, a very interesting article that was saying uh, that we haven't revealed yet all the potential of 5G and I think it's true. At this point, we have we know how many applications we can use, but uh, once it's implemented, I think uh, we can uh, discover a lot more uh, benefits from the technology. Thank you so much for sharing that, Gloria. I think especially now that we're all somewhat at home, mostly um, fast internet is something that someone everyone is looking for. We're all kind of looking forward to just connecting faster. With that though, 5G hasn't really been, I mean, it's slowly being rolled out. I believe Bell Canada is one of the organizations in Montreal and in Canada that has started implementing 5G technology. Rod, can you, um, do you have any insight to share as to, you know, the rollout process and some of the challenges that companies like Bell are, are encountering in terms of rolling it out? Thank you, Val. So with 5D, as uh, Gloria mentioned, uh, you know, it's slowly rolling out because it's a new technology for new technology, especially 5G, the distance, it's a bit shorter. So with that in mind, so there's a challenge of, uh, you know, implemented 5Gs, you know, especially in an environment like Canada, when it comes to a weather-wise or geographical uh, landscape. So it's making it a bit more difficult to roll out 5G. But there's a tremendous amount of progress and not only just to roll out the technology, but also you have to have device capable ready for this technology. As you many of you are aware, it's only now that even cell phone, Samsung uh, 20, uh, Galaxy 20 is the first cell phone uh, in that brand, line of brand that was released with 5G capability. And now as we see more and more, you know, company, more and more device are going to be releasing with 5G capability, you're going to see, a, you know, extreme implementation and fast adaptation of 5G, uh, you know, across the customer base. And as Gloria mentioned earlier and talking about AI, you know, a lot of us right now, uh, you know, we, we experiment a little bit with uh, Alexa or Google, you know, Google Home speakers. And think about it, you know, now when you ask a question, you have to wait to hear back from Google. It takes some time. It's a communication between machine. And with 5G, when that happened, you know, you have a latency of like one millisecond. So it's almost the communication almost instantaneous, right? You ask a question and you get your answer right away. And with that in mind, a lot of companies will take opportunity to utilize, you know, that technology. For example, for banking, I know Bank of uh, Capital One right now, they introduce uh, Alexa. So you can ask Alexa about, your, you know, check your balance, you know, track your spending, even pay your bill. So imagine if you're able to do that within just a matter of milliseconds. So those are the, uh, the benefits that uh, 5Gs will actually bring into a world of Thank technology. Thank you so much, Rod, for sharing. Um, I, you know, on Facebook especially, you tend to come across these articles and there've been a lot of conspiracy theorists, um, 5G articles talking about the health risks associated with the new towers. Um, do you have any comment on that? And this is open to anyone on the panel. Oh, I might be able to take this one on because I love a good conspiracy theory. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Um, actually, I've been hearing a lot, like, uh, especially around Easter time, like in the UK, a lot of people were starting to go ahead and burn down cell towers, uh, 5G cell towers, or cell towers in particular, uh, in the UK, wow. because they actually feared that it was linked to the coronavirus. Uh, so people were just, you know, starting that conspiracy theory, and then it was spreading not only in the UK, but actually to other countries within Europe as well. Um, but when you really think about it, like the cell towers um, and it being close to like a proximity of a lot of people uh, is really what the link should be or should be considered and not, you know, coronavirus and virology. Like, so I think that people were kind of confused with the two. So uh, I think that's an interesting conspiracy theory that 5G is actually linked to something that is viral. Well, I mean, consider, uh, I mean, Corona themselves as a beer company is struggling due to COVID. So it's very easy for, for people to make those connections, um, especially when you don't understand the, the socioeconomic situation and what's happening currently. It's, it's very easy to have our minds kind of go out there. But in terms of the health risks, do you guys feel that it's justified or um, 
you know, is there any, any proof that there are health risks associated with 5G? Uh, I, I have some comments about it. I, okay. I think they're not justified. I think uh, sometimes there's a certain, uh, I would say maybe resistance to technology because it moves so fast that sometimes uh, it's hard for, for people to keep up with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I saw once a very funny uh, cartoon that it was from uh, 20th century, I think, uh, 1900s. And uh, they were, uh, it was a cartoon about electricity. And it was also a conspiracy theory that electricity was uh, something to spy on people and uh, that it wouldn't bring any benefit. That it was only, uh, it, it was only uh, something to, to spy. So I think it's, uh, yes, people sometimes are afraid of uh, how technology evolves. And uh, we had, as I said, 5G is only the evolution from 4.3 or 3G, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, on, it's only for to bring uh, benefits, a better uh, way of life. So, uh, so I would say uh, it's, it's quite unjustified. Uh, there's no science behind it. And uh, for me, it's quite funny because uh, one conspiracy theory goes on top of another, right? Uh, for example, uh, they say that uh, exactly a 5G causes uh, COVID. But then I heard another conspiracy theory that uh, COVID was only an excuse because uh, the vaccine would bring uh, nanochips that, uh, that would be used to spy on people, that would be used to track them. And then uh, the funniest I've heard was that uh, COVID was invented so doctors could steal the liquid from our knees. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it goes on top of another, but uh, uh, science, it's, uh, it's as, as Shona said, it's, uh, it's one thing, it's uh, bioscience, it's biological, medical diseases, and another, it's our technological evolution, right? Yeah. Amazing. And you bring up a good point, uh, Gloria, that we'll, we'll talk about a bit later with SAFE in terms of the ethics around AI, right? It's part of you know, all of these technological advancements is that it allows greater access to us and our personal information. So, you know, I, I can somewhat empathize with the conspiracy theorists there in terms of what are the future ramifications. We have Pranesh who would like to ask a question. Um, feel free to unmute yourself, Pranesh. Hello, hi, uh, and I'm sorry for my English, like it's not too good. But I oh, just not have... at all. We understand you perfectly. Perfect. I mean, like, uh, I just understand that the broadcast distance for 5G is like uh, fairly low compared to 4G or other 3G communications. And in that case, like, the, it requires a lot of towers that needs to be placed in like close proximity to get the desired results. And that in turn actually causes a lot of electromagnetic uh, problems, which in turn uh, affects the human parts, like cellular systems. And uh, I mean, it's got nothing to do with coronavirus for sure. But uh, I'm pretty sure like there are like tested sciences that say that it actually affects human parts. So uh, can you tell me in depth as to like if this is actually true and uh, is something being done for this? And uh, is there any alternative to 5G or something like that? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll explain you uh, with the knowledge that I have. And uh, what I know right now is that every government is uh, bringing, has their own regulations about uh, EMF exposure, which is an electromagnetic field, right? So uh, every government takes care of uh, which are the limits of radiation that uh, either a customer or people uh, on the street, for example, or employees working on the antennas must be exposed to, okay? Also, on top of that, we have uh, international organizations that work uh, doing tests to, to see which are these limits and validate them and uh, everybody talks and discuss about uh, coming to an agreement about this. So 
there, there would be a risk, yes, if these limits are not respected, but I'm pretty sure that's why every government is uh, taking care of it. Every government uh, like in Canada, for example, you will find it in Canada Health, which are the limits of exposure. Uh, World Health Organization also has, uh, also has uh, regulations about it, has standards. So uh, I'm confident that uh, any country that is uh, being specific about uh, the standards of uh, exposure uh, don't put the uh, risk on people. Yes, sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say if I could add to that. I know that AT&T is actually this week on the August 7th going ahead and trying to release um, 5G uh, all over the U.S. Uh, where they provide, uh, you know, where they provide coverage. So I think it's going to be interesting actually to kind of see uh, in the coming weeks, months, years, um, what is happening within the U.S. because they're more densely populated per capita. Um, I'm interested to see kind of uh, the the um, pharmaceutical and the, the research that comes out from there um, so that we can go ahead and, and actually see. I mean, as of right now, we don't know. And I think it would be unfair to say that absolutely not, there is no potential. So interested to go ahead and see what happens. We take a, a wait and see approach. Thank you so much, Gloria and Shauna for your insights. So as we tr transition out of the 5G discussion, um, it does promise faster connections, more reliable data streaming, a variety of new options and, and new technologies that we all claim are gonna improve the customer experience, right? And you know, the promise of an improved customer experience means that customers are even more demanding in terms of their expectations. Um, so for maybe Sean and Rod, can you talk about, you know, what are the things that you guys are doing in order to move along with technology and make sure that the customer experience is being met? Sure. So as we mentioned with uh, 5G, it has been rolled out, especially with IoT. So uh, a lot of customer, experience uh, the focus is right now a lot of what they call omni-channel service delivery right so in the sense that the customer from when they get to facebook to a chat they want to take the the experience from the facebook either to move it to their mobile application from the mobile application they can go to the website to continue it, uh, it can be a transaction right and purchasing something so now company have to ensure that you know they are what they call an omni-channel service delivery that able to deliver this kind of services across all these different platforms for the customers, right? To enhance the customer experience. As you mentioned, the customer is becoming more and more demanding, right? So if you think about with 5Gs and everything rolling out, even in the banking, the banking is heavily regulated. If you think about uh, what the banks are doing right now, now you don't even have to go to the bank to deposit a check. You can take a picture of the check, you know, sign it and you're able to deposit it, right? So now those are the things that used to be able to walk into the bank, the brick and mortar, now they're moving that experience into your mobile device. So the more and more it's going to continue, you'll be able to, you know, with integration with IoT, just like I mentioned earlier with Capital One, you can ask what your account balance, can you pay this bill for me? So it's becoming this, you know, this all around, this one service channels. So the company now, they have to really, really not just before you just used to have a website, you have a mobile application, you have to ensure that whatever services you're offering or products, you're able to offer it in all these different channels to, to improve the customer experience. Amazing. AI is a, is a big deal in Montreal. Um, a lot of companies are investing in Montreal in terms of starting up AI hubs. Safe, um, can, you, can you kind of talk about why that is and why is Montreal such a hot spot? Sure. Um, so in terms of why it's a hot spot, I mean, uh, you know, if you were to, to track the history of AI, uh, a few decades ago, it was the AI winter. So the, officially the, the AI research started all the way back in the 50s, but uh, breakthroughs did not happen until very recently. Um, and, and two of the three current godfathers of the technology are Canadian. One of them is in Montreal, Yashua Bingio, um, at Mida. And so definitely the breakthroughs that were accomplished by himself as well as his team, um, in addition to the other uh, uh, godfathers around the world, sort of sparked that, uh, that uh, revolution in AI, um, which goes to show sort of the power of academics 
in uh, bringing forward innovation and, and bringing forward sort of the, 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 the prosperity to a certain region. So that's, that's how the hype happened. Um, and, uh, and out of that, I remember the stats now don't hold me to them, but I think two years ago uh, in, in Canada, we still held in Montreal the, the highest concentration of deep learning. Uh, which is one form of AI, or in specifically machine learning. Uh, uh, so we, we held the highest concentration of uh, deep learning researchers. Um, in Toronto, even, there's the, the highest concentration of, of AI startups. So, so that's why all the hype is happening, because all the companies, um, particularly if we're talking about tech companies, uh, started investing and, and pumping in investments in Canada, one of which is in Montreal, uh, to open AI labs. Um, and all of that is to capitalize on all this uh, uh, research that's happening uh, to, to create breakthrough solutions. A lot of, you know, which is, is what, what Rod and, and, and Gloria were mentioning in terms of improving uh, human experience. Of course, that's just one form, one form of it. So that's why all the hype is happening. Um, now to broaden uh, the, 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 the scope of discussion, so not necessarily just to the big tech com companies such as the Amazons and the Googles of the world, why companies are investing or at least starting to think about investing in AI, um, it's because uh, that they see the potential value in, um, in, in mimicking all the, 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 the cognitive um, abilities of humans via machine. Uh, number one, definitely, uh, can, can uh, increase efficiency and productivity. And of course, I'm speaking in broad terms. So that's one aspect. And, and another aspect is the capability of the machine to be able to scan a lot of data and uncover insights that a human would not be able to do by themselves. So, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the hype started a few years ago. Um, now, I think the, one of the main challenges, particularly uh, when it comes to the two points that I mentioned, number one, those large flow of investments happening in Montreal, and number two, uh, companies that are not necessarily the big tech companies still working in AI. I think the challenges with that is number one, making sure that technology is democratized. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of incentives for a PhD working in deep learning to go and work for Google. Uh, why would they not? So I think making sure that that technology is democratized uh, and not held hostage by a certain elite or uh, tier of companies, that's really critical. The second point, the challenge is, is still when companies that are not necessarily big tech companies wanting to invest in AI, you now if you speak to different companies, different companies even within the same sector, and of course different sectors are at different levels of starting to incorporate artificial intelligence and data. Um, but the challenges with that is um, still there's a lot of demystification that's needed um, in terms of what, what you can really do with data still with this le level of maturity of AI. Um, and, and, and data science. So number one is, is definitely um, uh, demystification. Number two, it does require a lot of um, sort of agile innovation, which, is, which can be new way of doing things and, and, and doing business within companies, especially if they're large. And number three, ultimately money talks. So yes, in theory, I understand that this is gonna reap me a lot of benefits, but how fast and how much? Great questions. Um, no, you're absolutely right. And it brings me to my next point in terms of, you know, one of the project hubs you spoke about where you collect public opinion. What is the general sense when it comes to AI and all of this development? Is it positive? Is it negative? <laughs> well, see, my, my, uh, now if, if I'm going to put my marketing hat, I'm going to say the report is coming out in, in, in September. So stay, so stay tuned. But, um, but joking aside, uh, we, you know, we work with Statistics Canada to make sure that our process is sort of on point um, and we course correct as we went along. Um, and so the, the, we asked really three main questions in terms of what Montrealers are thinking about AI. Uh, number one, uh, do they feel comfortable sharing data? With AI, so that's really critical. And I think part, I, I love the fact that we have people from around the world joining us here because when it comes to data privacy and data access, I think the perception and the culture, uh, let's say, in a certain region of the world, is very different than another region in the world. And ultimately, AI is a data race. So that's really critical. Um, so far, you know, almost 50% of Montrealers that we surveyed, and we surveyed over a thousand Montrealers of different course, backgrounds in every sense of the word, 50% are saying they do not necessarily feel comfortable sharing data. So that's number one. Um, the number two question that we ask is, do they feel included in, in uh, the AI ecosystem? And the reason why that's critical is because, you know, a very, very um, used example uh, when it comes to, to AI and, and bias is, uh, or, or, or technology, not necessarily just AI, is if I have a darker skin and I'm trying to use a soap dispenser, it does not det detect my skin. 
And so, you know, making sure that the data that we're feeding in, and again, we've heard this before, to any AI model is not biased. Uh, you know, we need people to be represented, not just in the deployment of technology, but in the creation of technology. So when it comes to inclusion, 65% of Montrealers are saying they do not feel included. So that's another really critical data point. And lastly, agency. So do I feel comfortable with AI making a decision on my part? Um, and that was sort of uh, split uh, uh, third, third, third. So a third of Montreal's are saying they do not feel comfortable. Third are saying yes, and third are saying they're neutral. So that's, that's the essence for now for the results. Thank you so much. Hold that thought. Uh, Pranesh has another question for you. Um, I'll let you jump in here. Uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, it's just that like uh, I've been doing a lot of research with deep learning and as of now like i'm just getting to understand that a lot of results that i'm getting is just based on the data that are being input and the computers themselves are not giving a proper valid response as to what needs to be exactly done rather than what is just given so it's just based on more data that you provide you give you get results based on that so uh, as you said earlier, the data that are being provided are also being limited. A lot of companies and a lot of people are actually not giving out actual data. Mm -hmm. And uh, that actually limits our understanding of like how that needs to be processed. Is there any other way that you would suggest that this can be like avoided or taken further? Because I feel like as of now, we've actually hit a breaking point where all the results and all the findings are quite similar to what has been found in the past two to three years. Mm -hmm. And there, is, there hasn't been a mega, major progress in this field, especially in the past two years, especially with NLP, like you've just come up with BERT. But apart from that, I don't see any progress. Is there any other innovation or anything that we can actually expect from AI in the near future. Yeah, I hear that. So, so when, you know, when I first hear that, I think that there's sort of one of two ways to, to try and address that in very different ways. So the first one is the technology piece, as you mentioned, meaning from a technological standpoint, is there a way to, to maneuver that challenge? Um, you know, personally, I'd, I would not have the answer to that. I'd be happy to, to take this offline and even connect with my colleagues who are, who, who, uh, the PhDs on my team to discuss that. But what, what is interesting for me is maybe the other way of addressing this, and that is the policy piece. Um, meaning going back to the, the, the earlier part of your question, you said, you know, I don't have access to data because either individuals or companies are not giving, uh, giving away the data. Um, and the interesting point is there's a lot of talk now about data commons. So that means, for, and, and an example of that is, is the super cluster that's happening in British Columbia in Canada, where, you know, we're trying to to pool data uh, from different resources uh, to f within the same area. Um, uh, another example, for example, is, is health. So in the sense of, is there a way to create sort of a mediator uh, between those who are giving away the data and those who, that are using it and maybe having that mediator who is uh, managing the data access, collection, treatment, and so on and so forth is neutral, is unbiased. And that way we are still sort of preserving the integrity of the data that's being given and the rights of the people who are giving away the data, but also enabling the people who are working on AI, such as yourself, to have the data that they need. So and again, that's that's part of the, the, the reason why we're doing the survey is to, to you know, when, when you say policymaking, it's actually to be able to move the technology forward, but in a responsible way. So, so one avenue is actually more towards the policy play than technological play. Um, but I'm happy to, to chat with you after about sort of specifically that use that you're doing, because I'm not familiar with it, uh, in the case that you're doing to see if there's a way from, a, from an AI modeling standpoint that, that can be managed. Thank you so much, Seth. Yeah, well, one other thing also, Val, uh, I would like to add in that, as Manish mentioned, you know, uh, with, with AI, it's, it's a predictive analytic model, right, in the sense that you co you, you're collecting a set amount of data and you put a statistical algorithm and with machine learning, then you predict what's the next outcome going to be. So, you know, then again, if your limitation, you have a limitation when it comes to the data, so your prediction only going to have a limitation. Uh, at least one of the companies that making good use of uh, 
AI, if you think about a predictive analysis model, is Netflix. For example, a lot of people don't think about it when you turn on your Netflix and you look at the recommendation, right? That, that being, say, oh, uh, what you should, because you watch this show, you know, then we propose you can, you know, you'll be like, able to like this sort of shows, right? So all that have to do with its predictive analytic model is taking the data, you know, your consumer data, and then, uh, you know, using statistical algorithm and, you know, be able to predict what next you will be able to like. So again, uh, there's a limitation with that. The limitation always come with the data, the amount of data collected. And because every company is doing their own set of data collection, as you see, there's not a uniform or a standard body of who collecting the data, a neutral party, and how that data is being shared or divided. So that's part of the reason that you slowly see you know, that we're moving any progression into the AI, uh, you know, further than where we are right now. Mm -hmm. and, and when, thank you so much for jumping in, Rod. So when we talk about data, right, that data needs to come from somewhere and nine times out of 10 is the consumer. And that hesitancy that's safe talked about in terms of people feeling comfortable giving out information, how does that impact your work especially in telecoms and maybe shauna you can jump in as well when you're suggesting solutions to your clients who have app uh who have apps for clients how do you factor in this hesitancy yeah i can go ahead and, and jump in here so i'll talk more about like what we actually do with our clients when we're going ahead and building an app we actually go ahead and have discovery meetings. So we want to get to the bottom of like marketing wise, what do they want to accomplish? What are their goals? Is it, and what KPIs are they, tar are they targeting? Um, is it to go ahead and reach a broader audience? Is it to go ahead and be a new entrant? What have you? Um, when we do this, we regroup with a number of different people within our organization. So whether it be from strategy, business analyst, programmers, uh, we bring all of these key team members to the table and as well, we meet with members on the client side as well in order to go through um, what their needs are. Um, coming out of that discovery session where we go ahead and have deep conversations in terms of like their KPIs, what they want to go ahead and reach, uh, then we go ahead and formulate um, a response back to them that basically says, here's what we go ahead and suggest and the path forward and that, like, how we would uh, actually like to go ahead and build your application coming up with different uh, data flow diagrams in terms of like how the data should flow, what the app should look like um, in terms of like user experience, um, you know, just some very key wireframes that we can then go ahead and talk to and say, yes, that should be within the scope of this project or no, it shouldn't. Um, so in terms of like the data, uh, we don't necessarily go ahead and start collecting that like uh, until like we're at the end, we sort of start to, it's almost like to go ahead and prove is our theorem correct in terms of like what we anticipate our client and our, con our consumers to go ahead and do with the application. Um, so we work our way, I guess you can say backwards in terms of like what we anticipate them to do. And then once we actually get to a point where we have something that's actually testable that we can put in front of a client, even if it's just wireframes, um, that's when we go ahead and prove is our hypothesis correct or no, and then pivot from there. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that, Shauna. Rod, is, uh, is it any different for you or anything to add? No, it's not any different in the sense that uh, even collecting the data, to collect any data on any consumer, the consumer will give you the consent, right? Because there's a lot of legislation. For example, oh, you have GDPR, which is General Data Protection Regulation, you know, in the EU that come in full swing, in Canada, we have different data protection as well. So even collecting the data, they cannot just collect any data on the user. The user have to give you the consent of collecting the data. And also once you collect that data, you know, transparency is key, right? You know, one of the things that that's why a lot of users are hesitant on a lot of different things, companies, even platform like Facebook, Instagram, Twitters, you know, those kind of brands, you know, you have to have that transparency with your customer to let them know exactly what kind of data are you collecting and why are you collecting that data. So quite often, that's where the bias came from, you know, from the customer, the hesitant is because they're not knowing exactly what that data is being used for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, let me see, I see we have a few questions in the chat. Nayel, do you see smart cities coming to life sooner rather than later in Canada? Sidewalk Labs recently canceled plans for a smart lab connected city in Toronto Harbourfront. What are the advantages and disadvantages of AI enabled 
and data collecting smart cities. Who would like to take that one on? Um, I'll, I'll jump in with my input. Actually, I saw that question and uh, and, I, and I really liked it. Um, I mean, the first thing that I would say, uh, thank Nail for the question. And you talk about side, sidewalk labs. You know, it's it's a lot has has gone into that, and I know that a big point of contention was IP um, in that uh, in, in in that project. So, uh, for me, what I'm thinking about is. Uh, when, when, when we ask what are the advantages and disadvantages of AI enabled and data collecting smart cities, you know, the advantages are the ones that we can think of in terms of the cities being more efficient, uh, being sort of maybe uh, 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 offering a more pleasant experience to live, uh, you know, self-driving cars and, and, and connected devices and so on and so forth. I mean, I'm pretty sure that it will require sort of collective innovation to envision what that future would look like. It's beyond our, our creativity maybe at the moment. Um, so that's in terms of the advantages. The disadvantages are the ones that I'm interested about, which is sort of what happens in terms of, as Rod was mentioning, in terms of data collection. You know, are we really informing people in terms of the data that uh, is being collected about them? So that's number one. Um, number two, other issues related to, to AI. You know, again, if we are using AI for connected cities, uh, inclusion becomes a very interesting question that's that's needed. So are we making sure that we're planning cities in a way that includes all sorts of demographics in every way, so socioeconomically, but also ethnicity-wise and so on and so forth. Um, and so the, the, the advantages are, you know, more technologically enabled cities that, that ideally provide a, a more favorable living um, situation. But the disadvantages are ones that have to come with not technology, actually, with the ethics piece and the values piece. So, um, you know, I feel like AI ultimately, actually, it's not about technology. It's an existential question for us as human beings to see how are we developing technology with human values. Um, I think if we got those right, then the rest will take care of itself. Um, and one of that, I will end with this, one of that is what's happening with uh, with IP specifically in Canada. You know, if we do have all these AI expertise, are we leveraging it in a way where we're infusing AI deployment with Canadian values? Um, and uh, and sort of making sure that IP is a, is a way that we can use it to, to, to infuse uh, future AI with Canadian values. Um, so so that's, that's, that's for me the interesting point is how can we infuse the, the ethics and the values piece into AI. Thank you so much, Saif, and, and thank you for the great question, Nayel. Um, all these technological advancements, so AI, big data, these are kind of big buzzwords that are being used by banks and, and Fortune 500 companies. How does one get into the industry? So if we have people in the audience who they have an interest in tech, um, what are some of the new roles or the new career opportunities that are, are coming out of all of this? I can go again. Um, <laughs> so in terms of how to start with the, uh, uh, or how to incorporate yourself into the field, I mean, the, the great, great, great advantage of living in, uh, in the 21st century is the ubiquity of information. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's, there's a plethora of, of, of resources and online courses that you can use to, to educate yourself when it comes to data science. I myself am an engineer. Uh, by, by trade and, and, and by training. Um, but when I first started working in AI, I was not uh, coming with a data science background. So I would say jump right ahead and take a few of those online courses. Um, any simple Google search to, to look up sort of what are the main courses or the most critical courses to, uh, to engage with, you're gonna find them in the top 10 hits. I mean, there's a, an AI for everyone course um, uh, by a professor in Stanford that's really useful. I myself used one in, in Udemy. So I would say that's number one. Number two, uh, you know, it, try to befriend a data scientist. <laughs> I, mean, I, I had the advantage of, and I see my fellow panelists are, are nodding along because, <laughs> because um, you know, yes, there's a lot, a lot of information that you can access. The downside of that is that there's a lot of information to access. So um, I spoke with, uh, with the data scientists on my team and I said, you know, can we deconstruct the main, uh, the technology into the main themes and main pillars that I need to learn? So, you know, when we're talking about AI, it's, it's essentially stats on steroids, to steroids. So you need to know probability stats and you need to know Python. If you got those, then, then the rest can take care of itself. Um, so I would say those are the two main resources. And I would say then when you get to that point, I think as you do that, it's good to 
speak to people in the industry because you can work in AI in many, many different ways. You can work yes, as a data scientist, you can work as an advanced researcher, you can work as a project manager. Um, and so I would say develop that foundation because then when you have that foundation, you'll be able to have critical conversations with people in the industry to see what fits more of what you like to do. And based on that, you can then decide future steps. Meaning if you actually do want to work as a data scientist, well, CATS and continuing education has a great program for data scientists, uh, for data science that, that, you, that you can do. And I know a lot of my friends who did that. Um, if you don't want to build to, to, to be a deep researcher, you can do a PhD. Um, but I would say have that foundation first, engage with people in the industry to critically think about how you need to move forward, um, but, but take that first step. Thank you so much, Saif. Shauna, um, you, you manage large teams. What does your, your team look like in terms of function? Yeah. Like what are the different roles that you have to kind of pull together to, to accomplish the work? Yeah, absolutely. I can go ahead and add in here. So um, I have a lot of different team members that will go ahead and work with me on one particular project. So if I take a look, let's say, for example, at the mobile app that I'm currently working on, um, I have a tech lead who is the one who is responsible for really laying the groundwork in terms of what the, what the technology is that we're going to be going ahead and using. Is it native programming? Is it um, some other, you know, Swift UI, new technology that's bleeding edge? Uh, are they up to date with, you know, the latest releases of iOS uh, and Android? Uh, he's really the person responsible for going ahead and leading that team of programmers. Underneath of him, uh, as I mentioned, there's a, a team of programmers uh, that all have different capabilities, some in Android, some in iOS, so that we could go ahead and bring the technology to market. Um, as well, I have uh, other programmers who are really in DevOps, uh, responsible for going ahead and being able to release the app. So um, working on the CICD pipeline so that the app can go ahead and be published along with uh, our particular client. Um, as well as I have other project managers and project coordinators who will go ahead and help with, um, with that as well. I have a business analyst uh, who goes ahead and actually writes the user stories. How will the app perform? What are we expecting um, in terms of like the tickets that will be written that the programming team will work against? Um, and then I have I have someone who's working actually in like user experience. So when we get to sort of like a midway point with the app, we're able to then go ahead and, pr and put it in front of users in order for them to start to take a look at. So utilizing tools like Look Back in order to garner their live feedback. Uh, that particular person is responsible for going ahead and communicating with the potential users and getting it back there. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds like an army uh, to make it, it kind of happen. Thank you for sharing that. One other thing I would like to add, Val, before you move forward with that yeah. in terms of uh, the hot trend in terms of uh, Korean IT. A lot of people, as we talk about the data scientists for AI, we talk about uh, application developers uh, that enjoy iOS, but there's another area that, uh, you know, we haven't even discussed yet, you know, all this data being collected, right? Because uh, consumer acts a lot for personalization, you know, they want it now, they want it yesterday, they want it personalized experience. So a lot of data with all this data being collected also make the customer feel very nervous. I don't know how many times any of you guys turn on the news, you see there's a data breach, there's, a, you know, a company is in a hot seat because there's the data, they, you know, they, they were not, able to protect the data properly. Uh, you know, IT security is becoming a very, very hard fill. You know, although we're collecting all this data, we're making use to it, uh, you know, what's going on right now, how do we protect a lot of those data, right? How do we protect a lot of those consumer data? And company that learn to do that the best are the company that survives so right now. If you look at probably one out of every three IT job, you're gonna see is an IT security job that's open. So it's a definitely hard fill. Anybody that looking to get into the fill, I definitely recommend if you have the capability, you know, if you, you know, you don't want to be a data scientist because it involves a lot of statistical, you need, you need a lot of math, you need a lot of different things, but IT security is another great area on how do you protect all this data that we are collecting to be used uh, for AI platform or, you know, uh, augmented reality. Or... Great. Thank you so much, Rod. Yes, cybersecurity is definitely um, a field that's growing in demand. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, Gloria, we haven't heard from you for a bit. Um, telecoms. So in terms of if someone wants to get more in the field, what are some of the new roles that are coming up in, in your area? Okay, well, that's a very good question. And actually, uh, it's very related to AI. 
a few years ago, uh, self-organized networks started to appear. And uh, this means that now uh, cellular networks will be optimized uh, automatically. So uh, maybe five, six years ago, when the, these platforms started to appear, uh, some colleagues started saying, we are out of a job because now a machine will do what we do, taking data, analyzing it, and optimizing it. So, uh, so what's the next step, right? So for me, the next path uh, and the next opportunity is, it's okay, we have to, uh, an opportunity to learn to operate uh, this, these new platforms, or we can also learn to develop them. We already have the background in RF in uh, several technologies, so we can bring a lot and contribute a lot to build uh, these technologies to uh, help uh, automate, uh, to automate uh, processes to optimize networks, to uh, improve customer experience, to, uh, to improve uh, the performance. Okay. So I think uh, a lot of the new opportunities come, to, uh, come together with AI. So uh, as I've said, uh, we have a big, uh, a big opportunity on learning data science. Amazing. So earlier when we, we first started the panel discussion, we talked about, you were talking about 5G in terms of like the different applications for it. Um, how will, we have a question from the audience, uh, George Bryson, thank you for asking it. How will 5G help the medical domain? And can you give concrete examples of that? Okay, so I have a few examples and uh, this comes also with, uh, again, we're bringing AI, low latency, uh, augmented reality. And a few examples, for example, uh, would be bringing uh, automatic updates to your doctor. Let's say that uh, now, nowadays we have, uh, there are, uh, there's availability of uh, devices to automatically measure the glucose. We have wearables that measure the heartbeat. We have uh, also uh, devices that, electronic devices that uh, measure the blood pressure and uh, send it to your smartphone. So all these measurements uh, at some point could be sent to your doctor and start building your file, start uh, making a record of it. And then uh, maybe uh, when something is abnormal, they would alert the doctor and say, hey, uh, something is wrong with this patient, uh, it's behaving different. That would be one application. Another one that uh, is quite interesting is uh, remote surgery. Nowadays, uh, uh, surgeons use uh, very advanced uh, machines to perform surgeries. Now we have the chance that maybe uh, they will be, they will be able to control it remotely. Thank you to thanks to 5G, because now the response time between the, between the doctor and the, and the machine would be a lot faster. And there is another potential uh, application, which is, uh, for example, uh, doctors take X-rays, uh, head scan, for example. They could bring it to a uh, to a machine and build a 3D image from it and be able to manipulate it or see it well. So I think it has a lot of uh, potential of, uh, of applications in medicine and uh, it's quite promising actually all the discussions around it. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that, Gloria. We look forward to seeing all these new developments, especially in the medical field. So thank you for sharing. And thank you, George, for asking the question. Uh, we have another question from Rashti. He's a data scientist with one year of experience and uh, he knows the basics, but is still struggling to get another job in the field. Um, I'm, I'm assuming this is directed to SAFE or maybe even uh, Shauna. Are there any internship opportunities in your companies? And Rod as well. Yeah, so I can go ahead and jump in here. So we actually do have a newly created a data scientist role that exists in our organization. So it's currently an N of one. It's a very small team, but uh, I would be happy to go ahead and, and connect and to see if there's anything else that, you know, maybe we could go ahead and expand upon. Amazing, thank you. There you go, Rasti. Uh, connect with Shauna on LinkedIn. Uh, is, that, is that correct? And um, you never know what might happen. Yeah. And on, on my end, I already actually shared my contact information. Um, uh, there's, not, there's, there's no openings right now. We might have towards the end of the year. But in all cases, uh, um, I'm happy to connect uh, Rasta because my, my, my colleague uh, and our technical lead 
Um, even if not at seed AI, he's connected and, and he might know av availability somewhere else. So I'm happy to connect for sure. Amazing, thank you. We have another question from Hamed. Uh, in what extent could AI help epidemiology? Okay, uh, Hamed, can you elaborate on that? I'm sorry, I was uh, I was actually getting back to <laughs> to rest. Can you elaborate on that sort of what's what's the incentive behind the question? Uh, if you want to mute your mic, uh, maybe you can. Oh. I mean, manipulating data on epi. Um, Hamed, are you able to to speak so you can ask the um, the question? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, for the, the actually valuable information. Well, in epidemiology, uh, we use uh, data for, you know, we analyze the data about the, you know, the pan uh, epidemic, you know, situations uh, like the one we are living there in I mean the COVID-19 so uh, AI can help to predict the you know the future uh, you know, conditions future uh, you know outbreaks like the the another uh, pandemic in the future could AI help help us to do so I mean the using the data and predict the the, the upcoming events I mean just like that. Yeah, I understand. Okay, so there's a, there's a few clarifications uh, clarifications to make, and I'll bring an example also to put that in context. So the very first thing to to clarify is AI should never be the 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 goal. It should always be the tool, and what for problem solving. And what I mean by that is, uh, you should always work with domain experts to be able to build cases where AI can actually solve a problem. So before I worked fully with Seed AI where we're using AI to solve problems for organizations, I was leading the AI initiative in a previous organization, Fortune 500 companies, um, company, and, and I actually worked with Seed AI initially uh, as their client, and they worked with us as domain experts. So the company was in uh, robotics and automation. The reason why I say that is because the domain experts are the ones that understand the business needs and the business challenges. Now. AI and data science is just simply another way to solve problems. And ideally what you'd want is to be able to either solve a problem with AI and data that otherwise you could not solve, or at least solve it in a way that is more efficient with data. But it's not something to use for the sake of entertaining the, 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 the uh, meaning, you know, you, you need to, to, to identify a business need that, you, that you're trying to solve um, with data. Now, the reason why I say that is because there's a lot of, sometimes we find with organizations, challenges of thinking of AI as a black box. If you're able to think of a particular case where you have a business need, the question becomes, do you have the data and the sufficient data for it? Now, the example that, that pops in my head when, when we're talking about epidemiology is actually the one about uh, predicting the interest rate. And, and not about epidemiology. So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, one of the first questions that we get usually, um, or the first examples that we get is, well, can I use AI to predict for then the, the, the future interest rate? And the, the, what we bring forward to the table is what happened to the Mexican pesos days after the, the, the American election in 2016 is that it dropped and no one could have predicted that win of the elections. And so, uh, you, you need to think about a business case where you have reliable data for, that then you're able to look at the data, identify patterns, and based on that, use the, 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 the artificial cognitive powers of AI to then be able to uncover insights. So in terms of being able to, um, to, to predict a future pandemic, I would, I would say that's a very big question to think of AI as a tool to, uh, to solve. What I would say is two things. What I would say is, what are the, the, the patterns that we did not pick up on? I mean, now I'm watching videos back from 2006 that said that an epidemic is happening or is going to happen. So I think in terms of uh, uh, looking at the underlying patterns of a certain 
business case or in this case a situation, uh, then you can use that to uncover insight that then can improve your accuracy to predict the future. Uh, so that would be one way of doing it. Another way of, of using AI for the sake of, of public health in this case is then looking at what are the problems that a pandemic is causing or might cause and how can we make sure that we collect data to solve the problems uh, uh, that we're now facing. For example, can we predict uh, a human interaction in a certain area versus another area using AI? So that's what comes to my mind. Again, I would ground th that question in what is specifically the business cases that you're thinking about and what data do you have? I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, yes, completely. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Saif, for answering. And uh, thank you, Hamed, for, for your question. It was great. Um, Quickly, Val, one yeah. other thing that I'm thinking right now and the way that we are using AI in terms of uh, infectious diseases, especially with COVID, if you think about it, we're talking about prediction model, right? Every time when you look at it, they're predicting X amount of people gonna get affected or X amount of people gonna be, uh, you know, gonna die from COVID-19 in certain region. And it, a, lot, a lot have to do with the AI modeling. A lot have to do with the data they already collected, that data is fit into a predictive modeling system. And, you know, based on that a project, you have a, you know, sort of a modeling. You know, so in, the, in that sense, this is the way that I'm thinking that AI currently is being used in epidemiology, but I don't think we have advanced to the point yet where we at this point that we can prevent a disease from happening or predict the next disease that's gonna happen. Again, remember AI always work off, you take past data, feed that data into a model, build on top of statistical modeling and predicting with machine learning, then you predict what the outcome going to be, right? So. So I don't think we're there yet, but in terms of since uh, it's being used right now, I think it's being used a lot in terms of uh, the modeling, data modeling, to understand what's happening next or what's going to happen. Amazing, thank you. And sorry, I was just going to add, Rod, if I could feed off of that. I think for anything that is in terms of predictive modeling or predictive data, the more data you actually feed into that model and the more it is able to learn from the data that is fed into it, the more accurate the model becomes. So uh, maybe right now for this particular pandemic, because it's so new, because it's something that we have not really faced in uh, nearly a hundred years since like the Black Death, it might not necessarily be accurate, but the more that it continues and we collect the data and we see who is, whom is affected, how is it go, uh, how are we best to be able to treat them? What vaccines have worked or not? I think feeding that into a data and AI model will go ahead and make that model all the more robust and actually better. Thank you, great points. Thank you so much, Safe, Rod, and Shauna. That was, that was fantastic. Um, it, it helped clear up a lot for myself. Um, given the current situation, given COVID, given the things that kind of come up, you know, technology is always evolving and advancing. In terms of making sure you stay ahead of the curve, you know, can you give some pointers in terms of what your companies are doing or what companies need to do in order to, to adapt and stay flexible? Shauna, would you like to jump in? Sure, I can go ahead and field that one. So actually one thing I really love about my, my organization, Appnovation, is that either bi-weekly or even weekly, we go ahead and have these lunch and learn sessions. So we are able to have different experts, uh, with different areas of expertise and knowledge within the organization actually go ahead and educate the rest of the organization on what they do. So whether it's on uh, user experience, UI design, uh, data science, uh, AI, we actually a couple of weeks ago had a session on 5G. We're able to get this learning that is you know, just in time learning from the best of the best within our organization and also key learnings that they've observed in their recent projects. So I think that uh, type of learning that is from within our organization, plus you know, our own, which is you know, looking at uh, the oldie but goodie websites like uh, CNET, uh, The Verge, um, coupled with you know, YouTube. Uh, I think all of these help to go ahead and, and educate myself um, on what's up and coming in technology. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else would like to jump in? So for me, one uh, the quick way that uh, one of the way that I stay abreast with everything that's going on. Again, you have LinkedIn Learning. There's a lot of if you want to learn a particular set of new skill, for example, if you're interested into learning Python or 
and you know any anything you know there's a lot of Coursera, there's a lot of platform out there that offer those kind of training that and then they, for an individual if you really want to keep up and stay with the current trend you can do that and also as shana mentioned you have seen it you have a lot of different business article a lot of it articles that you can subscribe to you know to to stay abreast you get those you know directly in your mailbox so you keep up with current trend that's going on either it's 5g either it's iot what is the next uh you know the next it trend thank you great uh gloria safe anything to add yes uh if anyone also wants to uh to know more about how uh, the next cellular technologies are evolving. Also a very good resource, it's uh, Follow3GPP. 3GPP is an organization that creates all the standards for uh, new technologies in, uh, in cellular. So uh, as, uh, if anyone wants to know how it's evolving, which are the next features, what's uh, coming in terms of applications, 3GPP, uh, it's a very good resource. And also another very friendly uh, uh, documentation that uh, you can find. It's also the Qualcomm site. At Qualcomm, uh, it has very interesting uh, presentations about not only 5G, other technologies, as about uh, IoT, uh, AI. So it's uh, it's it's very interesting if you want to learn more about. Thank you. Such great resources you're all sharing. Safe. Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, all my fellow panelists already shared a lot of great resources. And, and I think it depends from one person to another in terms of which resource they prefer the better. I mean, sometimes the, the MIT Technology Review is a great resource as well, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so I would say definitely find the one that's most useful for you. What I would say is actually, um, you know, try to speak to someone from that field. And I know that people are super busy. I, I truly, truly, truly get that. But I, for me, that's the way that I realized I learned the best is by doing that, that homework that I need to do, but then being able to, to ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, because if someone is, is uh, an expert in their field, they'll be able to, they'll be able to ask pointed questions and they'll be able to, to sort of break that down. So um, by all means, you know, use those resources, do your homework, but I wouldn't shy away from actually asking people for, for, for a one-on-one -on -one session. I've definitely done that. And I will, you know, as an example, I'll just simply say, uh, when, when I was working on a clean technology project, IP and, and particularly Canadian IP was a critical area. And I was reading a report about that, uh, that, was, uh, that was done by a venture capital firm here in, uh, in, in Montreal. And I really, really, really wanted to speak to the author of that report. Um, because there were, you know, there, there were some stats mentioned there. I was like, how did they get that, th those stats? And so I found him on LinkedIn, sent him a message, expressed my interest, uh, you know, tactful, showcased how, uh, the, the, how, why I'm reading this, this report is useful for what I'm trying to do, and that that's aligned with his value. He connected me with his assistant, we booked the session, and he gave me an hour of his time. So do your homework, but don't shy away from actually asking people in the field. That is priceless. Um, that brings us very close to a question that we had. Um, I have a business background and I have been in the field of data science and artificial intelligence for at least three years. After completion of multiple courses, certifications, as well as Kaggle competitions, I am still not able to enter the field of business, the business of AI, especially with the current situation we are having to go through. Is there a way apart from networking completing projects, learning courses online um, to get my foot in the door, or should I come up with other innovative ideas to get hired? May I ask a follow-up question just to, to understand? And by all means, this is, you know, my intention is not to be a buyer, but my understanding is I'm sure if, uh, if, if this is the experience of one, then it's the experience of many. Um, so to use this as a learning opportunity, I'm just going to ask a follow-up question and say, um, did you manage to sort of get any intel or feedback as to why some opportunities did not go through? So uh, I have been working and I've been studying in India. And uh, I've just moved to Canada like in the past six months over here. And uh, here the education isn't being recognized. Mm -hmm. So they prefer a Canadian education or a Canadian university or college or a five-year work experience in this specific field to get a foot into the door. Mm -hmm. So I just want some kind of like 
a networking system or some kind of a creative way to get into this field to get an idea to see how things go by. I understand. So, uh, you know, each situation is unique and has its own factors. Um, what I would say is the number one actually thing that came to my mind is, is one of our one of my teammates is a data scientist from India and she moved here all the way uh, from India with her husband. Um, and so, uh, you know, the reason why we, we did that is because we believed in her talent. Um, there is the Canadian norm that, uh, that you know, the, the Canadian experience needs to be on the resume. But I would say that some companies um, waiver that, that uh, requirement, such as, uh, as a seed AI. Uh, there's no way to know except for actually speaking with companies and seeing what their policy is. And it seems that you're already doing that. Um, what I would say is, uh, you know, finding a, 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 some sort of a platform that eases the transition um, is always useful. And what I mean by that is a, a, sometimes you don't need a full-fledged master's, let's say, degree to be able to onboard yourself into a new market. Um, that's where, and I, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm doing the promotion for cats, but it's sincere. <laughs> that's why, that's why, you know. Programs such as uh, data scientists, uh, data science programs at CATS or, 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 or other avenues are great because uh, number one, even if you, you, you have that experience, maybe that program will still solidify it more. And if for nothing else, it will give that seal of approval in terms of uh, having that geographical experience on your resume. And most critically, it will give you the opportunity to do some networking. So when I was uh, leading the AI initiative in my previous organization, we engaged some students with the work and some of the students actually came from the data science program that, that CATS is doing. So that professor, Professor Nabil, is speaking with many companies. I'm just bringing, the, bring, bringing that up as an example. Um, and so the, the, the conclusion of my answer is, you know, it is definitely challenging. Each situation is unique, particularly if you're changing geographically. I would say uh, sometimes doing programs uh, that are not necessarily full-fledged master's degree that, you know, may be expensive or, or, or to, to take a lot of time, but doing that will still be a solid way forward to transition into a certain region. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the question, Pranesh, and thank you for your answer, Saif, and it's so right. And I, I think this resonates whether it's data science or another um, field that you'd like to go in. Sometimes it's our approach and how we're approaching companies. So we invite you to connect with us, Pranesh, um, at CATS, um, and hopefully we can help you and kind of take a closer look at, at your approach in terms of looking for work. Uh, Nayo, do you mind sharing our email address with Pranesh in the, in the chat? We have another question. Um, I'm a recent grad at McGill's Faculty of Education. I recently found my passion for data analytics and have been learning analytics and coding at UDC. But sometimes I feel it is still hard to make such a career transition and to get a job in the field. Do you have any advice on how I can better position myself um, so I can stand out? And this is from Jinji. Would anyone like to tackle that? Yeah, Chingji. So one thing that uh, that I would add to my previous answer is uh, just, just from you know glancing over the information that you provided is something that I think would still be useful is doing uh, projects. So um, I see that you said you're doing um, analytics and coding on Audacity and so on and so forth. But I think actual projects um, will give you that real time uh, that that real life experience. Um, number one and number two will give you that sort of uh, a seal of, of, of credibility and I would leverage that in the sense that I mean this can be a challenge um, but but sometimes what what I did was I offered to do a task to showcase what I can do um, and so I would say if you are looking for a real-life AI project then uh, speaking with data scientists working in the field and asking them for those projects that, uh, that they would recommend from their work. Again, of course, 
data access and privacy will be a concern or, or at least an issue to make sure that you hash out. But if you do those projects, number one, you will get real life experience. And number two, it's a very sort of, you know, docile, no pressure way of uh, creating rapport with that person uh, in a way where you're learning, but you're also showcasing that you're legit. Uh, and so that's, that's something that I would say would be the next step after doing those courses. But again, nothing substitutes what, what uh, Pranesh mentioned in terms of speaking with companies and people in the field themselves. Uh, that would be my, my advice, but perhaps Valerie and the CATS team have something to add. No, uh, we completely agree with you and we extend the invite to you as well, Jinji, if you'd like to connect with us um, for one-on-one -on -one appointment with a career advisor, we'd be happy to help. And I just want to say, you know, I'm not, I'm not promoting uh, free, free labor, just to clarify. So there's a balance to do that. <laughs> just there's a balance to do that. But I think uh, that would be a very strategic way for you to, uh, to make those critical connections in the industry. Amazing. That, that actually is a nice close off um, to the session. Um, so the IT world, definitely their hard skills. Um, AI, there's, there's a certain level of solid know-how, AppNovation, there are certain concrete skills, Bell Canada, there's certain IT skills that you need. Maybe let's unpack some of the soft skills, which is the theme of the conference. What are some of the additional qualities in your respective fields that people need to have to be successful? Uh, perhaps Gloria, you can start off on this one. Sure. Uh, well, I would say that uh, one of the most important skills are uh, interpersonal. Uh, we deal with customers all the time and uh, most of the times we need to be able to handle a very stressful situation during a problem of big failure. So we need to be assertive. We need to be, uh, we need to have a sense of urgency when it comes to uh, talking to a customer. Why they're concerned? They have uh, they have their own customers that are being affected, maybe. So we need to be uh, responsible and react quickly, and uh, being able to be patient uh, to answer any of the customers' questions, for example, because they might be also very stressed, right? Yeah. So uh, basically, we need to be able to to have and uh, to be able to analyze a problem or a stressful situation. So, so I would say that uh, those are the most important skills. And uh, obviously uh, hard skills we know, right? Uh, engineering, uh, mathematics, physics, but it's uh, in terms of uh, interpersonal skills, I think yeah, they are really important. Thank you, Gloria. Um, Shauna, would you like to? I can actually say uh, utilized yesterday, grace under fire. Oh, so, I love that. Yes, um, I think because uh, especially when you're in a high stress um, position and dealing with a lot of either director level or C-suite level individuals, um, projects don't always go according to plan. Um, and I think that's one thing that I would say is a key takeaway for anyone um, hoping to jump into the project or portfolio profession. Um, I think that it's important to be able to go ahead uh, take whatever feedback that you're getting in whatever format that you're getting it, uh, assess it calmly, and then go ahead and be able to speak to exactly the problem at hand and how to go about and best resolve it. Thank you so much. Grace under fire. I love that. That should be your tagline. I love it. So, so for me, uh, besides, as we mentioned, all the hard skills that you need in terms of IT, data science and different things, security skills, one of the key skills is, you know, especially in the right now in 2020, it's EI, emotional intelligence, right? So you have to be able to, that skill is malleable. That's something that you have to, you know, to, to work on. So that's going to help you to be able to deal with a high pressure situation, to be able to deal with people, to be able to deal with a situation. So I think uh, definitely emotional and IQ, it's, uh, it's definitely one of the top skills. Amazing. Thank you, Rod. Safe. Anything to add to the list? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I think, you know, okay, with this conference, Cass is just showcasing that there's, there's great resources uh, that, that you can go to to educate yourself on, on soft skills. 
you know, we've heard the rhetoric about the need for soft skills a lot. This time last year, I was doing a, a research with my previous company and the Montreal AI Ethics Institute on uh, the future of jobs with AI and, and, and how AI is going to affect jobs. And there was a section for sure about uh, the, 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 the importance of soft skills. So those are the ones such as communication and so on and so forth and interpersonal skills. The one that I have to highlight is that, you know, problems in the real world don't come in a perfect package. And uh, they don't come to you sometimes uh, presenting themselves and, uh, uh, you know, describing themselves how and why there's a problem. Sometimes you just know something is not working out. And the, the, the you know, in a world where things are, changing a lot fast that's for sure you know i'm a millennial but i can testify things are moving sometimes too fast for me too um you know i would say that the the, the ability to uh to center yourself number one this goes back to grace under fire as shauna mentioned center yourself so actually having that ability within yourself to be able to distance yourself so that you're witnessing the situation and you're not part of the situation. And then number two, being able to deconstruct it into its parts so that you can describe the problem. Um, you know, the, 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 the soft skills that I need on my job is uh, how can I solve this problem when it's a real world problem that does not have a textbook? So in essence, what I'm trying to say is problem solving and particularly when it comes to dealing with the humans in the in the uh, in the problem you know when when humans are adding to the problem in a lot of cases they're not doing it intentionally they're just being who they are and sometimes they're doing it with good intentions but being able to have that eq uh dissect the situation be do grace and uh, have grace under fire and problem solve that is uh, the, the the number one uh, i would say need uh, right now that i'm experiencing in terms of self skills Amazing. Thank you so much to our panelists for sharing that information. Um, before we close, are there any last minute questions from the audience that you'd like to ask? While we're waiting for people to, to deliberate on if there are any last minute questions, are you guys open? Um, to, to connecting with the audience and perhaps we can share your LinkedIn profiles. If people have any follow-up questions they don't necessarily feel comfortable asking in the space. Are you all open to that? Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Amazing. Uh, Victoria has been kind enough to collect them all. Do you mind doing the honors? We have one last question from Gabrielle. Um, oh. They would like to transition their soft skills from the entertainment world into the AI. Uh, where should they start? Uh, I love this question. So can you share with me, Gabrielle, what are the soft skills from the entertainment world that that uh, that come to mind this the top one at least and if, if you can think of more two or three that would be great gabrielle feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask the question directly Because if, Gabrielle, if you're facing technical problems, let, let, let us know if you're able to unmute yourself. Um, I'll, I'll take a step at this with the information that I have. I mean, when I think of the entertainment world, I'm thinking, depends on where you're, you're, where you're positioned. Um, but the entertainment world, I would think, number one is you're, you're, you're trying to think of serving the audience. That's number one. Uh, and producing content for the sake of that audience. Uh, number two, I think if you are closer to the action, to what's happening on the figuratively speaking stage, then there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of pressure that comes to uh, that comes with that. So just from those two, the the soft skills that come to my mind is number one, if you're trying to put content for the audience, uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do in AI, particularly bef before we, we we work with the data science, still interacting with the client, there's a lot of um, Sort of educating on what AI is, and uh, uh, and then garnering 
the, 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 the intel of that client from a domain expertise standpoint uh, uh, in terms of what AI can do for them. So the, there's a lot of client interaction with, where you are sort of excavating for information from them. So putting together those workshops does require a lot of thinking of the audience. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? Why are they thinking that way? And then uh, crafting the message of your AI workshop so that you can guide them towards the right way of AI deployment. So, so uh, any soft skills related to communication and understanding your audience to be able to deliver a message, that's critical. Number two, as I mentioned, if you are closer to the action, uh, if you are then further down the line of, of AI deployment and you're working on projects, you know, I ran, <clears throat> excuse me, I ran into situations uh, where there's, there's a, a need for follow-ups, as Shauna mentioned, projects are not going uh, as planned. Um, and being able to, as soon as possible, ideally, as soon as possible, have that critical, quote unquote, sensitive confirmation, uh, conversation. I mean, I'll be transparent. One of those conversations was about data privacy, uh, where we needed to sit with the client and say, so-and-so happened, we contain the situation. How can we, you know, we made sure that we are very transparent with you from the get-go. Um, how can we problem solve together? Um, and so being able to handle that situation under pressure, um, and ideally by then you will have properly and adequately created trust, uh, uh, especially for innovation standpoint, um, that would be another soft skill. So handling yourself under pressure, creating trust and messaging. I hope that that answers your question. Feel free to uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn for, of course, we can have a more fleshed out conversation. Thank you, it does uh, speak to me uh, very loudly, of course. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm more into the, um, uh, able to uh, listen to what an audience needs and to conceptualize a, a proposition that will reach out to the public. So what you just said trans, uh, translate uh, to me very well. I just have to give it more thought, obviously, and then do more research to, as to how to apply those skills, which I excelled into a management level creatively uh, over the last decade or so. And I would like to be able to continue growing and applying those skills into different domain. AI seems to be uh, something that makes sense. You know? That makes sense. And I know we're over time. I'll just simply say that is more needed than you think, Gabrielle, because if you're talking about getting companies to work with AI, it's about actually fishing for their problems. That requires a lot of trust building and a lot of conversation where they feel comfortable to share their problems with you. So, so that's that. If, if you're not able to do that, you're not able to get AI mandates where you're able to then deploy data science. So it's more critical than you think. It's a gatekeeper skill. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much for your question, Gabrielle, and just say thank you for, for articulating the answer to that question. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you for staying over. I'd like to extend a very warm thank you to our panelists, Gloria, Shauna, Rod, and Saif. Um, thank you for giving us your time. We hope that it was useful. There was a lot of insight, a lot of tips, a lot of advice. Thank you all, and we hope to see you at more sessions at Power Skills 2020. On a side Thank note, you, shout out Thank to Jeffrey, the Jeffrey yeah. Lachman. You left your camera on. Good to see you. Long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Wow, a lot to learn here. Was uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Was it pretty amazing? Thanks. Yeah. Log in people out manually. Yeah, let me help you with that. More. Move. Just give us five minutes. We'll be with you shortly. Jeffrey, do you, do you mind unmuting yourself really quickly? Oh, is oh, he gone? I, I just put just him, just him, him in the, the uh, <laughs> I put him in the way. <laughs> okay, sorry, I just, we'll, we'll keep Jeffrey. Okay. Where did he go? I don't see Sean now. But... Oh, she's gone? Okay. Oh, sorry, but... You all this uh, put in waiting room. 
We have seven people in the waiting room. Patricia. There we go. Oh, nice person. There we go. Oh, sorry for kicking him guy. out. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, because I, I know he recently posted he's looking for work, so I wanted him to make sure he connects with uh, the panel. Yeah, I just want to let I you know, guys, safe that too. you're going to be overwhelmed on LinkedIn by uh, new <laughs> requests. Um, I don't know nothing on tech, and I already have people adding me on LinkedIn during this session. <laughs> so, um, um, the Facebook Live, Niall? Yeah, it's a good thing to do that. Thanks. You gotta always think about this, stopping the recording.